Thank, Thank you all for being patient. patient. Uh, for those of y'all who are joining us on Zoom, uh, we just ask that you please mute your microphone and use the chat for your questions. Um, we'll have a Q&A session at the end for everyone. Uh, also, a reminder that the next History for Lunch is scheduled for Wednesday, July 19th at noon. Uh, we're going to welcome Charles Oldham, who is an attorney and an award-winning author, uh, for a lecture and signing of his new book, Ship of Blood. Um, he will take you back to October night in 1905, um, when there were several crew members of a vessel off of Cape Fear found murdered. Um, it was a sensational trial that made it all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, so definitely come to check us out for that on July 19th. Now, today we welcome Gary L. Watson, PhD, who is the Atlanta Distinguished Professor of Southern Culture at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, he's going to give us an introduction to the 17th century Albemarle. Uh, as early as the 1650s, Virginians began building homes along the Albemarle Sound. Um, some rejoiced to find the goodliest soil, but irate officials denounced the settlement as a rogue's harbor. Uh, lead us to wonder who was right. And so to find out, we will welcome uh, Dr. Watson. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much, Noah. It's a great pleasure to be back at the Museum of the Albemarle in, in Elizabeth City. Uh, and I'm delighted to see so many uh, folks here uh, with me. Uh, and I'm try not to disappoint as we go forward. Uh, I'll have to start uh, at the beginning uh, by um, with an apology. Uh, I know most speakers uh, include a PowerPoint these days. I did not because, um, you know, there was a tragic lack of photographers in the 17th century out in mind. <laughs> So we're just going to have to do without that, if, if you all don't mind. All right, so here we go. All right. Um, we'll start with a quotation from Governor Thomas Culpepper of uh, Virginia uh, in, uh, in the period we're talking about. And he said, Carolina... I mean, the north part of it always was and is the sink of America, the refuge of our renegados or renegados, I don't know how he said it, uh, until in better order, dangerous to us. Dangerous? Now, as uh, we may see, Governor Culpepper had or thought he had ample reason for this disdainful critique of his southern neighbor. But uh, English assessment of the character of North Carolina's Albemarle Sound country had not always been so negative. About a century earlier, earlier uh, Captain, Captain Ralph Lane, Lane commander of Sir Walter Raleigh's second expedition to the place he called Virginia, expressed very different sentiments. We have discovered the mainland to be the goodliest soil under the coat of heaven. He wrote to an English supporter and went on to report enormous grapes, medicinal herbs, abundant maize, and wild sugar cane. Besides that, he continued, it is the goodliest and most pleasing territory in the world. And revealing his imperialist ambitions, he added, if Virginia had but horses and cattle in some reasonable proportion, I dare assure myself being inhabited with English people, no realm in Christendom would be equal to it. And the English people uh, came along soon enough, or well, a century later. Now, um, the fields I passed this morning certainly do testify to the goodly soil of the Albemarle region, but I think we have to admit that the sweet gum trees of the goodliest soil nearby have never produced uh, any um, precious for perfumes that I know about, or uh, sugar cane, or medically proven drugs, or maize that multiplied 400 times per ear. So I think we have to allow for a traveler's exaggerations. But uh, Lay's enthusiastic description stuck. Uh, others reworded uh, it as the goodliest land under the cope of heaven, but it has been an <clears throat> irresistible advertising slogan for North Carolina ever since Lane's otherwise frustrating voyage. 
So let's now fast forward almost a century after Ralph Lane's phrase making. Finding that uh, the goodliest land was not attracting a satisfactory number of settlers, the Colonial Assembly of 1669 declared that no person transporting themselves into this county after the date hereof shall be liable to be sued during the time and space of five years after their arrival for any debt or cause of action given without the county. Now, in translation, this meant that anyone moving to the Albemarle settler, uh, settlement, excuse me, anyone moving to the Albemarle settlement could stiff their outside creditors for five long years. So I warn you not to try that with your credit cards. The uh, rules have changed. But the new law apparently worked. New settlers allegedly hastened to the Albemarle to escape their creditors, earning their new home the stinging label of Rogue's Harbor. That reputation lingered for many years because distant merchants were still complaining that North Carolina would not require fair payment of honest debts as late as the era of the American Revolution, long after the offending statute was forgotten. And fugitive debtors were hardly the worst of it. North Carolina's casual approach to law enforcement attracted many of those whom Governor Culpepper called renegados, how, outlaws on the lamb, for example, or footloose apprentices and indentured servants, redis, uh, religious dissidents, a goodly share, no doubt, of unhappy spouses and even pirates. With much more justification, runaway slaves also made their way south for from Virginia's plantations, seeking refuge in the shadows of the Great Dismal Swamp. So <clears throat> all these characters were um, uh, thought to be threats by the authorities. So no wonder they called it a rogue's harbor. So what was uh, early Albemarle really like, the goodliest land or the refuge of scoundrels? It obviously depends a lot on your point of view. For a fuming creditor, North Carolina was undoubtedly a roguish money pit. For desperate insolvents, it could be a blessed relief. To sort this out, perhaps the earliest, uh, the early Albemarle deserves a closer look. But what I'd like to do here is to use these two rival expressions to unpack a little about the early English history of the region we're in to understand more about its little known complexity. So what was Albemarle County anyway? As a political entity and a place name, it doesn't exist anymore, except as a county in Virginia, uh, but it was once one of three original subdivisions of the province of Carolina uh, that the Lord's proprietors received in 1663. Uh, the others, uh, by the way, were Craven County near mo around modern Charleston and Clarendon County at the mouth of the Cape Fear. Albemarle County took its name from a proprietor, George Monk, Duke of Albemarle, and its central sound took his name as well. The county's boundaries were always vague, but uh, the county embraced the northeast corner of modern North Carolina. The region lost its name and its separate existence in 1738, and its precincts, subdivisions of the county, became new counties on their own. Be, thus, Pasquotank County, for example, Crimmins and, and the others. But before the arrival <clears throat> of the English, <clears throat> the Sound region was home to several thousands <clears throat> of Algonquian-speaking Native Americans. They lived in small groups ranging in size from 50 to several hundred and lived by farming, hunting, fishing, and gathering uh, wild plants. <clears throat> Artist John White who uh, sailed with Ralph Lane, captured their images with charming portraits of men, women, and children in simple deer, deerskin clothing, and uh, his images of their uh, villages, some stockaded, some not, with houses made of arched poles and covered by bark mats or hides. John Lawson, who was another uh, early traveler, summed up his description of Carolina Indians with an impressive tribute 
expressed as a severe critique of the English. We reckon them in, as slaves, he said, in comparison to us, and intruders, as oft they enter our houses or hunt near our dwellings. But if we will admit reason to be our guide, she will inform us that these Indians are the freest people in the world, and so, are, and so far from being intruders upon us, it is we who have abandoned our own native soil to drive them out and possess theirs. Now, to the west uh, of uh, Albemarle, uh, on the other side of the Roanoke River, lived uh, another Indian group, the Tuscaroras, a much larger uh, group related to the New York Federation, who call themselves the Haudenosaunee and known to later colonists as the Iroquois. The, the Tuscaroras would later become formidable English adversaries, but in the earliest decades, they were better known by rumor than by actual contact. Now, most of us know the story of the famous lost colony, Sir Walter Raleigh's ill-fated uh, effort that followed uh, Ralph, Ralph Lane's expedition. Now, modern archaeologists have found tangible hints that at least some lost colonists may have ended up near Edenton, where the Chuan and Roanoke rivers that meet to, to form Albemarle Sound. But uh, whether that's true or not, the lost colony's 1787 disappearance halted English colonization in this area for two decades until Captain John Smith's colonists founded Jamestown up uh, north near the more accessible Chesapeake Bay. There they built up Virginia around the culture of tobacco, first with European indentured servants and later with African slaves. After a rough beginning, Virginia became so successful that some 17th century settlers became quite wealthy. Looking ahead, they sought protection from soil exhaustion by buying up as much available land as they could. Uh, and they also took advantage of changing commercial conditions by increasing their use of African slaves. These circumstances made life increasingly difficult for poor farmers and freed servants who began looking for new homes in the 1650s and 1660s. The Great Dismal Swamp impeded their search, but Southern lands were quite cheap by Virginia standards. So a trickle of migrants began to feel their way toward the future Albemarle. The first one we know about was a fur trader named Nathaniel Batts, who built a house on Salmon Creek in modern Berkeley County. And I should also note that I drove across Salmon Creek on my way here this morning and passed a historical marker to the same Nathaniel Batts. By 1663, when King Charles II granted a huge expanse of land named Carolina to eight of his favorite courtiers, there were probably about 500 whites and Africans already living on the shores of the Chuan, Proquimans, and Pasquotank rivers. Few Indians had resisted their passage for many, had, many of the Indians had probably uh, perished from epidemic diseases left behind by lost colonists and other European wanderers. Now, uh, according to later Virginia officials, the chief cause, quote, the chief cause of immigration in North Carolina is the want of land to plant and cultivate. But migrants were also escaping the restrictive society and government uh, of the crowded Northern colony. Like the leaders of Virginia, the proprietors gave free land to newcomers, but these so-called head rights only amounted to 60 acres for every free man and 50 acres for their dependents. Purchases swelled these land holdings to an average of 375 acres uh, per householder in the proprietary period, which was much smaller than some of Virginia's vast estates. Also, unlike Virginia, most uh, uh, recipients of Carolina head rights were married and arrived with at least one family member, but almost three quarters of the households in a typical, typical precinct like Pasquotank owned land. So Albemarle settlers, all, uh, it is also true that Albemarle settlers also enjoyed wider religious freedom than res residents in other colonies. So 
we're we're pointing towards the good, goodliest land here, obviously. Only one Albemarle household in five contained enslaved people, most of whom were Africans, but some were Indians. Uh, but we unfortunately know almost nothing about the lives of these earliest captives. It does seem, however, that Africans who found freedom uh, by one means or another in Albemarle enjoyed more liberties than their counterparts in other colonies. And we have enslaved Africans and some who were free. Um, but uh, North Carolina later fell in line with regional customs in the following century. Uh, North Carolina did not adopt a formal slave code until 1715, for example, and the rules of uh, or North Carolina's laws about slavery were uh, at first noticeably more permissive than Virginia's or South Carolina's. So Albemarle's earliest English residents were therefore uh, small to medium-sized farmers who grew their food with family labor and avoided cash crops grown by bound laborers. For the most part, they had little choice because the swamp and the perilous inlets through the Outer Banks limited exports to the outside world. They, li <coughs> excuse me, they lived in modest comfort without the luxuries uh, available in a more commercialized society. Author uh, John Lawson found that any person with a small beginning may live very comfortable and not only provide for the necessaries of life, but likewise for those that are to succeed him. Irish visitor uh, John Brickle agreed, reporting that only modest indu moderate industry produced all manner of necessaries for the support of a family, while as late as 1765, a French observer reported that North Carolina was a fine country for poor people, but not the rich. So based on these conditions, it's not surprising that out, uh, outsiders also believed that Carolinians avoided unnecessary work. Virginia's uh, William Byrd immortalized this reputation in a well-worn job from his book, Histories of the Dividing Line uh, in 1728. Surely there's no place in the world where the inhabitants live with less labor than in North Carolina. It, he said, it approaches nearer to the descript, description of lubberland, that is a, a paradise for lazy people, than any other by the great felicity of the climate, the easiness of raising provisions, and the slothful slothfulness of the people. Uh, and uh, he went on to talk about how food, how uh, much the crops grew and how abundant food was. The men for their part, just like the Indians, impose all the work upon the poor women. To speak the truth, tis a thorough aversion to labor that makes people file off to North Carolina where plenty and a warm sun confirmed them in their disposition to laziness for their whole lives. Now, I don't know if that is true or not, but uh, John Brickle also endorsed William Byrd's criticism of men by praising the work of Carolina women. The women are the most industrious in these parts, he reported. Many of them by their good housewifery make a great deal of cloth of their own cotton, wool, and flax, and some of them weave their own cloth with which they decently apparel their whole family, even if large. Others are so ingenious that they make up all the wearing apparel, both for husbands, sons, and daughters. Others are very ready to help and assist their husbands in any servile work, as such as planting, when the season of the year requires haste, pride seldom banishing housewifery. So um, we've got this uh, picture of uh, everybody, at least all the men, at least uh, taking it easy. But it is also true that the same author, uh, authors reported a profusion of goods that could be produced in North Carolina. The produce of this country for exportation to Europe and the islands, Brickle insisted, including include dead beef, pork, tallow, hides, deerskins, furs, wheat, Indian corn, peas, potatoes, rice, 
honey, beeswax, myrtle wax, tobacco, snake root, turpentine, tar, pitch, masts for ships, staves for making barrels out of, planks and boards of most sorts of temper. Uh, and he went on and on uh, uh, with examples and finished by saying they also export abundance of horses to the islands of Antigua, Barbados, etc. So as in Virginia, the greatest of these products was tobacco. Added together, these glowing, glowing requirements remind me of Alice's Restaurant. You could get anything you want, supposedly, without having to work for it. So, so far, score one for the goodliest land. Now, um, proprietary government, when it came along, seems to have descended on this idol with an unwelcome thud. Not only did the uh, inhabitants um, avoid work, but they also seem to have lived with very little government. In the earliest days, Virginia called this area its southern plantation and ap appointed one Samuel Stevens to be its commander, but distance and terrain apparently minimized his actions. In other words, he doesn't seem to have done much. The proprietors appointed a governor when they received their charter, but did little else at first. In all, they planned or started at least four different governments in Carolina's first year, but only implemented the last one. Their one semi-permanent achievement before 1667 was creating the province's three counties, one of which was Albemarle, and beginning to appoint their officers. Now, um, perhaps the problem was that the proprietors wanted a compact densely populated settlement that would be easy to govern. Uh, that may have slowed them down because they ordered Albemarle to confine its settlements to a 40 mile square between Virginia and the Sound in which the areas dispersed, no, an instruction which the areas dispersed population and jagged coastline made impossible you know, try drawing a square around the Pasquotank River. I mean, really? Now, most of their other demands were equally unrealistic. In 1667, they changed the government again with a document they called the Fundamental Constitutions of Carolina. It placed a feudal nobility atop an elaborate string of subordinate social classes, uh, most of uh, the members of which held a peace of a graduated network of land grants, reverse pyramid, uh, each with its own set of courts and officers. The declared purpose of the feudal of the fundamental constitutions of Carolina was um, uh, to avoid erecting a numerous democracy. So forget all talk about how the founders wanted to establish democracy, it wasn't true. Like its predecessors, the fundamental constitutions was utterly unworkable and never fully implemented. The proprietors suspended it in 1669, that is only two years after it was promulgated, for a quote, temporary plan of government that lasted for 22 years. So now these various governments most important duties were the issuance and regulation of land grants. And their policies here were as confused as the various constitutions. Uh, I'll spare you the details, but the upshot was that no, with all the changes, no colonist could be sure that his heirs would inherit his land or that uh, his land title was good um, from one year to the next. To make matters worse, governors came and went, and as many as seven years could pass before the proprietors bothered to replace them. So seven years with no officers at all. And these were punctuated by spells of arbitrary, unstable, and frequently unreasonable power. The colonists responded by trying to ignore the government as much as possible. Now, this combination of autonomous colonists all out there doing what they wanted and arbitrary government giving orders here and there, 
was the recipe for an explosion that de detonated when a new governor named Thomas Miller arrived after a long period of ad hoc administration. When Miller violated customary procedures and tried to uh, uh, empower a dissident faction, the majority arrested him and packed him off to prison. Uh, yeah, uh, an incident known as Culpepper's Rebellion. More disorders followed his imprisonment <clears throat> with jailed governors, deposed officials, overwrought trials, and hysterical charges of cor corruption that went on until 1791 at least. That's approximately 15 years. So upheaval, upheaval, upheaval. Score one for Rogue's Harbor. Now, um, in other words, we've got these very vivid, contrasting um, images of Albemarle County. And I have to say they must have been sharply contrasting realities as well, comfortable colonists, stormy officials, and so on. Um, now, um, it appears therefore that colonial Albemarle was the goodliest land because it enjoyed modest prosperity and limited government. We probably all like something like that. And it was also Rogue's Harbor because it also suffered insecure property, anarchy, and rebellion, among other things, not to mention slavery. Well, an obvious lesson to me is that utopia and calamity in the past as well as now often depend upon the eye of the beholder. In other words, creditors hated debt relief and debtors loved it. Householders enjoyed modest prosperity, while women, children, and slaves did much of the work, if we're to believe these reports. Free people enjoyed free government until its wheels came off. Was Albemarle thus the goodliest land or a rogue's harbor? I'd have to say it was something of both. Uh, and we could continue with stories of witches, Quakers, Indian wars, and pirates but I will save those till the next time. So thank you very much. I'll be, uh, so Noah, how do you want to handle questions? You said you wanted to use the chat, but uh, yeah. uh, distant people can do that, but people in the uh, auditorium yes. might dispense with it. Any questions for Dr. Watson? Yes, sir. Ma'am, I'm sorry. Uh, it's dark. You were saying one of the presentations, and you alluded to the fact that there's no, there's a lack of visual. Um, yeah, that. compared to some other places. Yes, that's but true. You talked about, if you recited verbiage from what, ships a lot? Or? Uh, these were um, m m men. Uh, who traveled through Carolina and wrote books about what um, what they had seen? So um, some uh, there were a few illustrations in some of these, but none. Of, but all of them were illustrations of animals rather than people. Uh, I, I rather wish they'd drawn some of the people too, but or and houses and other things, but they didn't. Did that stuff? Did that? Uh knowledge and that material go back to England? Uh, they were, uh, John Brickle's book was published in Ireland, in Dublin, and uh, John Lawson's book was published in, uh, in London. And William Byrd's book existed in manuscript that he passed around among his friends um, and was uh, put into print after his death. And he died, I think, in the 1640s, the uh, 1740s, I'm sorry. So uh, these were all word pictures rather than drawings. Does that help? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I would say the development of the cities along the coastline here. Yes. Relative to the 300 acres that were given. At yeah. The uh -huh. still some sort of sense of where. Um, Land was allotted versus this is going to be the harbor here uh -huh. in Edmonton or 
was the city or how were how was it was it just a deep water access that the city surrounded they weren't obviously somebody who owned 300 acres and was the city no so how how does that part play out in modern day okay um well the uh the earliest um fixed abodes of English people in the Albemarle were on their farms. So the, the 300 acres were scattered throughout the area. Uh, the oldest town in North Carolina, no, that's not true. The oldest town in the Albemarle is Edenton. And uh, it uh, started in 1715 and then got its charter a few years later. Uh, Landowners laid out streets and said, okay, and then divided into lots. And somebody who wanted a store could buy this one. Somebody wanted a tavern, bought that one, and so on. And so it gradually developed in that way. Um, as far as, or obviously, they chose that spot because you could take a boat into the interior by the Chuan River, at least a little ways, and you could go uh, even deeper into the interior by the Roanoke River, and they both came together there. Uh, and the purpose of the town, like most towns, was trade. So uh, people brought what they had from the country to sell it in town, and the people who bought it there um, may have sold it to some of the local people, but their uh, biggest market would be abroad. So they put it on boats and sell it on. Uh, the alternative was to put your tobacco in, in big barrels, hogsheads, and to roll it up to uh, the Chesapeake area uh, there and sell it to, uh, to a, uh, you know, a foreign vessel there. Now, um, it's unlikely that anybody um, said, I want a town, I'm going to build it on my land. Instead, they looked for the place where there would be a good anchorage, anchorage, as you said. But deep water anchorages were um, uh, didn't exist in Albemarle Sound uh, compared to New York, Philadelphia, Boston, uh, and so on. Uh, and the um, the inlets through the outer banks were ex especially shallow and very hazardous. And then of course, there was the turbulent ocean graveyard of the Atlantic beyond that, uh, which meant that um, large ocean going vessel vessels could not enter Albemarle Sound. They had to anchor in the ocean, transfer their cargoes into small boats, and then they proceeded up to um, either to Edenton or uh, any other place uh, up and down the sound. Uh, oftentimes, planters who had farms on the waterfront would put a pier out and um, the boats would come right up to that and they wouldn't uh, go to a town at all. Uh, so um, the result is that uh, urban development was uh, was uh, stunted in North Carolina, Virginia, and, and elsewhere in the South. Uh, so uh, the towns that did develop were more or less or grew up haphazardly. Um, the Bath is another early place uh, that developed, and um, early Bath had about fifty people in it, and. Um, I have to say, it doesn't seem to have many more than that now. So it was, was not, uh, you know, a metropolis. And, and that was really the case with, with the other towns as well. Now, Elizabeth City, I believe, was founded much later. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think, I, I, I'm guessing here, it, it, the logical thing to believe is that Elizabeth City was founded because the Dismal Swamp Canal connected with its river and then went up to the Chesapeake. So a logical place for a commercial center would be there at the mouth of that river. Tom. Were the influx of the Amish um, uh, settlers coming down from Virginia have hastened the development of the, the um, 
Canal or any of those three routes? Well, the um, the religious minority that was most prominent in the colonial period were Quakers. Yeah, and, and the Quakers came because the proprietors, being very anxious to get all the settlers they could get, um, renounced any idea of religious persecution, whereas the whereas the uh, Quakers faced jail and uh, you know whippings and all this kind of thing in Massachusetts and and elsewhere. So uh, Quakers did come uh, to North Carolina, and for uh, decades they were the only organized religious body uh, in the outer world. The English established church was legally the official church of the government, but there were no Anglican churches and no Anglican priests and no Anglican congregations. So it was kind of a theoretical proposition, but uh, the Quakers were there and ultimately came into conflict with the government when they became very numerous in the assembly. They were a lot of them were elected and the government decided uh, that they were dangerous there and, and imposed a requirement that everybody in the government take an oath of loyalty to the queen, uh, Queen Anne, uh, and Quakers don't take oaths. So that was a way of uh, harassing them out of the government. And from there, um, another rebellion developed uh, called Carey's Rebellion. That was in the 1700s. Early 1700s. We have uh, one question on Zoom. Okay. Uh, can you say more about Camden as a center for governance in the Elmore region? When did Camden get established in relation to the rest of the uh, Sound region? Okay. I'm, I'm uh, caught uh, shorthanded there because. I don't uh, exactly know, but I believe Camden County was the last county in this region to be created, and at least on the north side of Albemarle Sound. So uh, stands the reason that the town of Camden also came along much later, but I, I couldn't tell you exactly. The, the four original uh, precincts later called counties were Curry Tuck, Passport Tank, and Chuan. And then came Bertie and Hyde and you know various others um, as settlement moved outwards. Yes, sir. How about uh, Nixon's Little River? Okay, um, I, I'm getting out of my depth here. I, I think the very best thing to do is try your phone <laughs> because. The, played out in yeah. Fox, like seventeen hundreds. Uh huh. Thriving community, can yeah. you see? Yeah. All those things are are quite true, uh, and uh, that was about a century after the period I've been talking about today. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Did uh, any of your research tell how? Elections were held. Uh, uh, yes, by voice. Uh, on initially, so um, the uh, clerk would open the election uh, on a table uh, in front of the courthouse, and voters would come forward. Somebody would write their name on the list, and they would say, uh, "I vote for Joe Dukes," and they would write that down. So uh, Joe might be standing there and uh, noticing who his friends were and keeping score. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the elections were not exactly uh, what we call free and fair uh, today. But um, sometimes people were elected who were very much uh, opposed to the status quo. And uh, the uh, there was one assembly that as I, I've told you, threw the governor in jail. So, uh, you know, it, it was not um, as much as a dictatorship as it sounded like. Then later on, 
when North Carolina uh, declared its independence and wrote its own constitution, uh, the first state constitution declared that all elections would be by ballot. So that's when um, you know pieces of paper and so on uh, replaced the um, oral announcement of who your preferences were. Yes, sir. Oh, ma'am, I'm sorry. I'm still in the dark. Uh, some, yeah, some in in places like uh, Edenton or Plymouth, uh, those those small boats that did the um, the traffic between the Upper Albemarle and uh, Currituck Inlet uh, or um, Ogrecoke Inlet were um, were locally made because uh, they. They were probably not big and strong enough to uh, undertake a long ocean voyage, so they were uh, probably uh, homegrown. Oh yes, that's quite true. Yes, uh, so the um, being a ship captain was uh, uh, a prosperous occupation and. And yet you couldn't, uh, the, the practicality was that you couldn't bring your wife and children along, so uh, they had to stay put. One other question on Zoom uh, asking, is the Elizabeth City we know today the same one I've seen in my research dating as 16.8? Virginia court records identify the city and the corporation of the city. I don't think so. I think that's somewhere else, Virginia. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm reading the book on uh, Tidewater, Virginia. It sounds like it, uh, that area kind of overshadowed this area. We're talking about shipbuilding because of the deep water. People yeah. Also got the mm -hmm. uh, you know, the James River, those areas mm -hmm. are much more useful. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm sure that everything commercial was more developed in Virginia. The population was greater. Chesapeake Bay was deeper, uh, and the uh, volume of tobacco produced was much greater. So it was a business center and a, a manufacturing center, if you will, manufacturing ships. Now the big the big uh, ocean going. Sailing ships were built in places like uh, Boston and um, uh, places like that. Uh, and those ships went over to England, they went down to the West Indies, and so on. And there was actually a, a huge um, dispute when um, Virginia thought. Uh, excuse me, uh, England thought that uh, the North Carolinians were doing too much smuggling um, and they uh, imposed a tax which was really uh, impossible to pay because it exceeded the, the size of the tax made the tobacco too expensive for anyone to buy. Uh, so the smuggling continued and uh, the big ships would come and park uh, out in the ocean. The little ships would go through uh, the inlets there and um, pay the captain a bribe and, and off he would go. And then when they tried to enforce that tax was the moment when when the governor, when Governor Miller tried to enforce that tax, that's when they put him in jail. Yes, ma'am. Oh, down here. Uh, Speak up. I'm sorry. It's, it's yeah. with a light in my eyes. I can't see you. Governance by the Lord's proprietor. Yeah. Sounds pretty haphazard. I um, think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when Charles, we all know it was a political payoff. Uh huh. Having backed him. Yeah. Uh, but did he have some kind of over bigger plan? Did they have to report back, like, yeah, we're doing well, or the empire is growing? Or was it just a political payoff? And you don't need to report back. I think it was more like the latter because uh, Charles uh, gave this uh, province of Carolina 
going from the Virginia Carolina line all the way down uh, halfway through Florida. And of course, he had no business giving that land away. Uh, it was all the Indians anyway, and uh, ha a part of it was being claimed by the Spanish as well, but that didn't stop him, he just did. And uh, he gave the proprietors um, what he called uh, all the powers of any Bishop of Durham. And the Bishop of Durham in England used to be an all powerful uh, medieval uh, figure who was, uh, had all the powers of the king, except he had to uh, obey the king, uh, it couldn't, couldn't uh, make laws contrary to those of the rest of England and so on. So that was the only limitation uh, on the proprietors. And uh, they, uh, their primary interest was in selling land and then collecting taxes on it um, or quit rents they were called. Uh, so they wanted as many settlers as possible and they wanted their uh, government um, to be, um, I don't know, to encourage that movement. But they also got spells when they wanted uh, more control so that people wouldn't go off and start farms where the tax collector couldn't find them. <laughs> so uh, they tried to push people close together and then they slacked off and, and so on. Um, the result of their, oh, and then uh, as time went on, proprietors began to sell their proprietorships to other people. Uh, they lost interest in it. Uh, they weren't making very much money, so they didn't pay much attention, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in uh, 1628, the Crown decided that there was too much disorder and too much, um, too many loose ends, uh, essentially, and bought back seven of the eight remaining uh, shares, and Carolina became a royal colony in which the king appointed the governor, and there was a regularly elected assembly, and officials who uh, were a little bit more responsible about uh, the land that they uh, sold, and so forth. So that's that's uh, where the proprietorship heads uh, in the years ahead. Yes, ma'am recommendations of books that would tell you about the early settlers, the earliest families in this area, particularly down at the Outer Banks. Right. Um, I can't tell you much about the Outer Banks. Those uh, areas were settled rather late because um, they weren't uh, great farming territory. Uh, people didn't uh, care about the scenery so much as uh, as the pr productivity, but the best books written about um, proprietary North Carolina are the ones that I have mentioned, written by people on the spot. So John Lawson, L A W S O N, the Natural History of North Carolina. It has lots about the plants and animals, but also a lot about the people. Um, and then John Brickle, no, I'm sorry, Lawson's book was called A New Voyage to Carolina. I've got that mixed up. So John Lawson, A New Voyage to Carolina. And John Brickle, A Natural History of North Carolina. And William Byrd, Histories of the Dividing Line. And the reason for that title was that Byrd was a uh, Virginia aristocrat appointed with uh, uh, to a committee of three Virginia aristocrats to meet with three um, gentlemen from North Carolina and accompanied by a group of surveyors and uh, axemen to uh, measure a line between North Carolina and Virginia, starting on Curry Tuck Banks and going as far west as they could go. Uh, they, uh, 
that was done in uh, 1728 in preparation for the sale of Carolina back to the crown. The king wanted to know what he was buying. So uh, Byrd um, amused himself by keeping a diary and writing a history of uh, what happened. And there's an official history that was published in this rather sober and dull. And there was his so-called secret history that um, is hilarious uh, because he made fun of everybody he ever came in contact. With. So uh, both of them together are um, very revealing about Byrd's attitude towards the North Carolinians. And it might not surprise you that the Virginia didn't think very much of the North Carolinians. So uh, nevertheless, if you sort of read through that um, screen of um, amusement and um, snobbery, uh, you can learn a lot. So those three books, I would say, are really the very best books about this area that have ever been written. What was the John Lawson book again? Um, a New Voyage to Carolina. And, you know, these books, uh, you kind of have to skip around if, you know, don't get um, imprisoned by the order and so on, because some of them, uh, or all three of them kind of wander around a bit, but uh, they still have a, a lot of wonderful material. So, some, yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so you said that the Virginia was very much Oh yeah, now uh, David Stick uh, wrote a wonderful uh, history of the Outer Banks uh, some years ago, but it still makes great reading, and uh, there are other books about okra coke as well. So um, going to the public library, looking under the subject index, okra coke, uh, or Outer Banks, or Albemarle County, or Twan County, uh, you know, they'll just be a, um, a big stack. Keep you busy. Yes, sir. You were speaking about the Quaker settlements and the Anglican Church. Uh -huh. I would assume that the Anglican Church was that the only denomination denomination heard until after the Revolutionary War. Uh, the other Protestant denominations were allowed. I well, they didn't ban other Protestant denominations. The proprietors had insisted that there be religious freedom. Um, that didn't mean entirely freedom from harassment because uh, the government did uh, try to boot Quakers out of the government uh, in the early 1700s. And ultimately they did succeed and uh, the uh, uh, St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Edenton was built and uh, it had a clergyman and then St. Thomas in Bath and so on. So. Uh, but there really were not more uh, than about a half a dozen active uh, Anglican parishes in North Carolina at the beginning of the American Revolution. And the six, so it was a very weak establishment uh, that only had churches here and there. At, uh, about a generation after the American Revolution, um, the uh, Episcopal Church organized as a kind of a successor uh, to the Anglican Church. And uh, they got a bishop and began to, um, I don't know, put them, pull themselves together. But that, of course, was much later than the period we're talking about now. Before that, uh, the Quakers on the, um, uh, in the Albemarle were, um, uh, supplemented, probably outnumbered by uh, Baptists and Methodists uh, who were the most popular denominations coming out of a series of revivals in North Carolina in the 1740s. So uh, the religious profile of the Albemarle um, began to resemble the rest of North Carolina, except there were more Quakers here than there were in most places.
Dr. Watson, thank you so much for coming and thank you all. <laughs>